Welcome back. If you missed the previous video, that's where all the context is. We're first going to be installing the clutch pedal because it's probably the hardest part of the whole thing. And if you're on a time constraint, you can still drive the automatic with this installed. First order of business, the brake light switch. This turns to the left and simply pops out. Next, disconnect the push rod from the pedal by prying off that complicated looking tab thing. There are six nuts holding the pedal in, four on the brake booster and two on the bottom of the dashboard. If you thought removing the automatic's pedal was hard, just you wait. So I'm going to take advantage of the extra space under there and knock out the punch for the master cylinder. Fun fact, I bet there isn't footage of anyone actually doing this anywhere on the internet, so now you've seen something very few people have. I was miraculously able to fit a drill up there and start the holes from the marks on the inside. I then moved the wiring harness out of the way and found it much easier to ream those out from the engine bay side. With the brake booster as far out as I could comfortably get it, I raised the clutch pedal into place. Okay, this is apparently possible without even touching the brake booster. I don't, I, I, there's no, I don't see how that's even possible because the brake booster rod needs to go under, it needs to go under that flat piece way up there that the camera just absolutely refuses to focus on. Okay, I gotta take the, the brake booster entirely out in order to get the pedals up here. Okay, clutch pedal has been attached. This is just loosely in here now. This whole thing had to come forward to like here to get that push rod out of the way. I had to take off the shock mount here and push the shock under the vehicle. And we had to, you know, bend the brake lines all that way and I disconnected this hose. And I had to take, I don't know what this thing is, but I had to take that out. This is your brake light switch. I had to take that off the old pedal. But it's it's loosely in there now, and I'm going to leave it loosely in there because I still need to put the master cylinder in. And the line that goes from the master cylinder to the slave cylinder goes like behind the rake booster, so I'm going to leave that sort of loosely attached for now. Now we can take out the center console by first removing all those fast food napkins to access two screws on the bottom of the storage tray. Pry off the T-bar and pop the selector bezel out of place. There's a small light bulb behind it and the four-wheel drive selector bezel, so don't rip the wires. Under each of these is a screw. With the handbrake all the way up, I lifted the center console out of place, followed by the heater vent tube for the rear seats. I then cut some small pieces of carpet out of the way for easier access to the tunnel cover and for, you know, weight reduction. Four 10 millimeter bolts hold the handle mechanism to the cover. A lot of this stuff is pretty straightforward. This is your linkage that goes to the transmission that tells it what gear it's going to be in. And this is the linkage that goes to the key up to the dash where you can hear it. Uh, this is what lets you take it out of park only when the brake is pressed. So I just snap those out of their holders. I think I'm just going to leave them in here. There's no reason in trying to get them out because I don't, I don't even know where that goes. So I ain't even going to try to figure out how to get it out of here. And now I believe with uh, some elbow grease, this whole uh, gold plate will come out of here now. Freaking screw right here. You guys seeing this? 
Dude, somebody must have lost that like 30 years ago. With the carpet cut, it's a lot easier to reach the uh, bolts that surround this cover. There are a few of them, including this one, except not this one. If anybody's ever seen the 242 swap video, you know exactly what happened to that one. So here I was getting this bolt out, right? And, uh, ooh, what's this? Oh, yeah, I'm rich. Oh boy, it's always the damn interior stuff that's the hardest. It's at this point I'm going to direct you to another video I made long ago in which I document the removal process for the AW4 transmission. Your next step is to take out all the automatic stuff, and since I already have a video for that, I won't waste any time here. Because I'll now have a manual, I had to punch the small tab out on the ASI linkage for a manual install. Next, it's time to transfer the transfer case. Alright, it's probably a really bad idea to do by myself. Let's see how heavy a 242 is, huh? Oh, come on now. Christ. Oh boy. God, that thing's gonna weigh like 150 pounds. So, on the AX15, two of the mounting bolts for the transfer case got stuck onto the nut, and you can't get them out of the flange that they attach to. So, I'm gonna have to cut them. I already got one off. Freaking tough bolts, let me tell you. Yeah. I'm about to blow your minds with the most useless information you've heard all week. So, this is a 1999 NP242 transfer case. Oh, look at that. It was built on September 15th, 1998. That's pretty cool. So, this is actually different than a 2000 plus NP242, believe it or not. They are interchangeable, don't worry. I'm like, I'm not saying they're not interchangeable. There is a subtle difference. Can anybody spot that difference? I doubt it. But, here's the indicator sensor wire for the 2000 plus XJ. What's different about this is that it, there's a connector right here. On 99 and prior years, this connector doesn't exist and this connector here is just part of the whole transmission harness so there's not a separate piece here on the 99 and older models now because of that it doesn't need to be mounted anywhere uh, so there is no mount for it on the top of the transfer case here instead that mount is down here this is for the o2 sensor this is where that connector attaches to and for the 2000 plus gang this is instead up here fun fact because it's somewhere somewhere up here it's on one of these bolts so this connector attaches to that mount right here and then this just pivots around and plugs into the connector right there so because i have a 99 transfer case in my one xj there's nowhere for me to mount this little connector thing which is not at all any sort of meaningful problem whatsoever and this in no way affects anybody's life anywhere in the world nor will it ever but now you know just sits on there G 
Jeep's got a pilot bearing now. Here goes nothing. Wow, okay, I got that off. I was not expecting it to actually come off. But now it's stuck in the sock. It's cold. Okay. Did not know that was like a separate piece there, if I'm completely honest with you guys. That is nowhere near as heavy as a flywheel, holy Christ. And stuck on the dowel pin again. Voila. The back of the 4.0. Oh my God. These have been replaced before, holy shit. Oh my God. I do, I, I am in complete disbelief right now. Holy shit. You didn't miss much. I just got the clutch hydraulics in here. So that, the slave cylinder needs to be fished all the way down through this mess. And uh, this kind of was hard to get in here with all these wires. I just took them off of their plastic clips. So, I've just got this kind of freely sitting in here before I get anything else on, just so that I don't have to try to fish it around a flywheel and a transmission and whatnot. This this way it's already here, and I'll just have to be careful not to break it when I'm putting all that stuff in. So with the clutch hydraulics in, I bolted down the clutch and brake pedal, and now they are nice and securely attached. This one is not, I don't have the uh, push rod in the master cylinder yet. So this thing just plugs into the master cylinder. It just pops in there and it's held, it holds itself. And then this end attaches to the pedal. Uh, I don't wanna put this in yet until I've got the slave cylinder hooked up to the transmission because I don't, I don't know what this is gonna do or if it might cause any problems. It probably won't. Uh, just, being, just being a little careful, you know what I mean? Because I have a 2001 XJ, I just cut off the exhaust hanger. If you have any year other than 2000 plus, you don't need to do this. Some of you might notice that suddenly the adapter plate behind the flywheel is gone, and that's because my dumbass forgot to put it on when I put the flywheel on the first time. So I actually got the flywheel, clutch, and pressure plate all put on there and bolted and torqued down and everything. And then I was like, oh dang, I forgot that, that metal plate thing that's supposed to go on before all of that stuff. So yeah, I had to take it all off and put it on again. And you might notice this flywheel is a bit rusty. It's fine. It's, it's, it, you know, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It's totally normal. It's, it's, I, don't even, I don't know what you're talking about. You can't even see it anymore. Look at that. I will also point out that, yes, I did this entirely by myself in 21 degree weather. It was a pain in the ass. And yes, I did it all twice. <laughs> oh yeah, that was tiring. Come on. I totally asked my friends to come over and help me too. You know, I was like, hey man, if you help me put this manual transmission in here, I'll let you drive the thing. It's going to be awesome. And so one of them came over and all he did was hold the crank steady while I was loosening the torque converter bolts. And another one came over and all he did was put two bolts in the bell housing and plug in the indicator sensor for the four-wheel drive light. So, I mean, you know, technically, I guess they did help. All right, everything's all torqued. Now, the transmission's ready to go in. Yo, that's a nice manual swap you got there. It'd be a shame if it snowed. So, yeah, the forecast said it was only going to snow one inch and it dumped like five inches overnight 
Uh, so yes, this is why I hate Wisconsin. Anyway, there were a few inside days. Here I'm trying to get this seal that goes on top of the hole that the gear lever goes through replaced. So I'm just taking that all apart. Right, so I'm after this seal. I needed to replace this because obviously, you know, just look at it and here's the new one. So in order to get this off, you have to take the gear lever apart. Yes, it's like in two pieces and you have to separate them, which was really hard to do. So I'll show you how they're put together after I show you how to get it apart. So I took a pickle fork in a cheater bar, wedged it up against this, whatever this is, and uh, hit the end of it over here with a sledgehammer repeatedly for about 10 minutes until, you know, eventually the peanut butter soaked into it and it shot out at 50 miles an hour. But eventually it did come out and we have these four little divots in here that line up with four little pegs on the inside of the shift lever. So that's how it stays in there, just snaps in there and you just got to pull really hard to get it out. Uh, now, that's probably never been done before on this transmission. With the spring and the retainer clip and the whole thing all cleaned up, this needs to go on here now, I believe. I believe it goes this way, right? That would make sense. That would. Okay, so I'm going to have to somehow fit this square through this hole without ripping it, so I'm probably just going to have to put like some grease on there. Next up is this little thing. This is the shift bushing. It did not need to be replaced at all. You know, it was fine. I just kind of figured while I have this all out, I may as well shove a new one on there. Oh, that's going to be really hard. Here's everything ready to go in. I've got the seal on here. All I did was put a dab of axle grease on here and it slipped over it easily enough. So this thing is just going to drop into the hole. And then I gotta line up this collar here. This, the angle of the square bit needs to be facing backwards as that angles the gear lever towards you. So, this gets pressed down in here and then twisted to the side. And now it's staying in there. And then the seal just kind of slides down the neck here and, okay. So that's on there. Now that's sealed good. And I've got a short throw shifter. So next up for this thing, I need to replace the release bearing and the little return spring for the clutch fork. I didn't get a new clutch fork, but uh, it, it'll, it's just a stick. The uh, release bearing is fine. It's got a little bit of blade in it. It's fine, but you know, gotta replace that stuff anyway. Oh, that just pops right off there. Okay. Cool move. Good. Got it out. Got it out. Cool. The release bearing is just attached to the fork by these two springs, as I kind of figured. Let's see here. Oh, look at that. Okay. That's not hard at all. So... It's going to align the new one in there, and then just about, okay, there's one side, there's two. All right, and just like that, your new release bearing's on. So if I am not mistaken, the return spring sits over the edge like this. That's actually the old one. I put the old one on there. So I'm being really smart today. I think that's that's how it's done. And that holds it there. Should that be that loose? Huh. Well, it still functions. <laughs> Behold, Subaru mode with a manual. So the 242 bolted right up to the AX15. That's ready to go. I just filled it up with 3.32 quarts of 
Synchro Max freaking GL4 or whatever fancy transmission fluid. This this stuff. MT90. This stuff right here. So now I'm going to cart this over there. Put it in my Jeep. So same old trick I used in the 80 before removal. I'm going to jack up the back end so that I can tilt the bell housing down under there and get it under the vehicle. Okay, so I've, everything here is good to go. Uh, I've got the adapter plate, flywheel clutch, pressure plate, the slave cylinders are ready to go. This is a vent hose and the wires are out of the way. So, I'm going to put some grease on the input shaft. Oh yeah, and I'm going to... I had to take out these bolts, that would probably be a good idea. Alright, well, they don't give you much grease at all, but I got, I got it on there. What is that scraping on? Oh, muffler. We're good, we're good. Just a muffler, guys. Oh! Shit, it's probably a good idea to put the CPS on, huh? Alright, we're golden, man. I want to go for it. Lol, it's the next day already because I kind of gave up trying to do this yesterday. It's 21 degrees out here, by the way, which really sucks. But anyway, I'm not really going into too much depth on this whole install procedure because no offense to anybody out there, but like if you don't really understand the basics of how this stuff works and goes together, then you probably shouldn't be doing a manual swap. It's, I don't mean to say that in regards of like gatekeeping, but there is a certain level of like mechanical understanding that you should have before doing something like this. This is not something that, you know, if I were to just like buy an XJ and as my first car, I would not just like turn around and immediately manual swap it. It is, it is a pretty difficult thing. And, uh, the hardest part of it is just finding everything, really. So that's that's why the previous video was a lot more in depth than this one. So anyway, I got the transmission mounted to the engine. I've got the two side bolts holding it there. So I'm gonna lower the transmission jack so I can get the top bolts in. The top bolts of which, I mean, these E12s, right? But these kind of suck. So I bought new bolts that have the exact same thread pitch and you know, they're the same size. They just have a hex head instead. I don't remember what these are off the top of my head, so I'll just put it on screen. And then another thing, the slave cylinder has that little zip tie thing on it. You're not supposed to cut that, just leave it in there. And then I'm gonna bolt this down. And then the first time you press the clutch pedal, that zip tie just breaks and it just stays in there, I guess, is how that works. I'm not recording everything because I'm just too excited. I wanna, I wanna get this done. Nuts that hold the mount to the adapter plate, as far as I know, don't have a torque spec. But as long as you crank them down good and vocally announce that's not going anywhere, it'll be good. I'm putting the adapter plate on. Once this is on, I can put the cross member on and then get the mount bolt to do it. Holy shit, it's cold out here, man. So in the back, we got the automatic cross member. In the front, we got the manual cross member also. In the back, it's a 2000 plus with the centered mount studs. And in the back, we've got the 99 prior with the offset studs. So firstly, differences between automatic and manual. 
Automatic is, this part is all flat. It's raised up three-fourths of an inch compared to this one where you can see it goes down here. So there's your difference between automatic and manual. Then there's the difference between 99 and prior and 2000 plus. So 99 and older have an offset transmission mount where the studs are off to one side. 2000 plus have a centered transmission mount where the studs are just in the middle. And you can see that difference quite obviously right there. I gotta remember to slow down and record some stuff every now and then. So the cross member's all in, mount's attached, it's all torqued. Uh, I got the slave cylinder in there. I don't know what the torque spec is for that, so I just, you know, made it made it nice and snug. I uh, got the exhaust attached, and uh, the trim bezel came in the middle. This is the trim bezel that the shift boot fits around that pops into this slot on the center console. Finding a factory one of these can be pretty challenging, as they are pretty rare. And they're also just made out of cheapo Chrysler plastic. They aren't... You can see how easily I can bend that and thus break it. These ones are the real shit. So this is the exact same thing. It's just 3D printed. And I can like put my whole body weight on that thing and it doesn't break. Not that you really need something like this to be strong. But still, that's... Look at that. Look at that. I'm gonna be a freaking trim bezel salesman. Oh. Incredible. I got an idea. All right. The ground is frozen solid. Okay. So this ain't gonna just like sink into the dirt. It'll probably just puncture the tire. Look at that. Indestructible. You run it over with a freaking Comanche. All right, let's try it on the engine side, huh? Oh, oh my God. It actually broke. Holy shit. Now, I think you need to redesign it. It's a piece of shit. Worthless. Can't even... Can't even run it over with a Comanche man. I just want to point out too that the part that did break is not at all essential to how it works. So that you still have this ridge here and you still have all four of the clips that hold it into the center console. So this part is not at all integral to its function in any way. This is just, I don't know what to say man. Alright, so there was some concern about how this thing would hold up to being in a hot car in direct sunlight for multiple hours. And uh... We got 140, it's about 140 degrees right now. It's been sitting in front of the fireplace for about an hour and a half. And uh, it's still in one piece. There's no, there's still no evidence of melting. It is very structurally sound still. That is really hot. I gotta, I gotta chill out. This thing will never be in direct sunlight anyway. So I doubt it'll ever get up to 140 degrees regardless. But even still, this could get a little bit hotter before anything started happening to it. Okay, after it's been sitting in front of the fireplace, I'm now going to leave it outside. Let's see. <laughs> what is it? Yeah, negative 8. It's supposed to get really cold tonight. So this will simulate driving from Florida to Wisconsin. Alright, well I wish I could have got out of here earlier before the sun came up. What's it, two, two to four degrees on there? One degree. And uh Yeah, it's still fine. You can you can twist this quite a bit and it doesn't snap. I think the dogs have been keeping an eye on it. Do you approve? I don't know, that doesn't look like a 10 out of 10 to me. We'll do some more tests. <gasps> oh my dear lord, it broke. No! Okay, so consensus, it cannot survive being thrown across a driveway after being left outside overnight in Wisconsin. But 
this thing is a freaking plastic interior trim bezel. Uh, I don't imagine that it's going to accidentally be thrown across a driveway after being left outside in Wisconsin overnight. So I think we're good. The reason I wasn't so afraid about breaking this one is because, well, I still have the factory one. But Brian actually sent me two of them so I could perform some scientific research on it. So I've already got his other one attached to the shift boot, and it's ready to go. Could the stock one have survived even one of those tests? Honestly, no. The, I mean, I don't want to break it because it's so rare, but this is a cheap piece of shit. In the previous video, I mentioned that you could theoretically cut this up and make it work in place of this, but I don't even want to begin to think how hard that would be. I can see, I can see how it, it might work. Like you could, here, I'll try putting this on. I think trying to get the automatic bezel thing to work is more trouble than it's worth. Eh, you know, especially when you can just get one of these from Bryant Sap. Okay. The finagle is rod up here somehow. should be able to just push the pedal down yeah there we go snapped right into place and that should be a functioning clutch all right i felt the uh plastic thing snap oh that is so smooth oh my that is beautiful I'm gonna have to sit here for a couple minutes and just do this. Oh my god. Alright, now I'm gonna put the tunnel cover on here, which is very straightforward, just a pain in the ass. Alright, yeah, pretty straightforward, nothing too exciting happened. Uh, this sheet. The cover plate, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to go under this, but I didn't do that because it's really hard to get it under there. So there is a tiny bit of a gap right here. If that ends up causing any problems, I will probably just cover it in duct tape or something. I don't really care. I don't know. It's I'm pretty sure that'll be fine. Uh, here's your lower shift boot in place. I don't know if there's any footage of this. So... Feast your eyes. <laughs> so the uh, the shift cable and the this other cable for the key, I'm just gonna leave them under there. That's usually what people do because they're you know it's kind of a pain in the ass to get that all out. I already put the trim piece back on, and also there's this extra light for the the PRNDL uh, shifter thing. Obviously the manuals don't have anything that lights up in the gear lever, so I don't know what I'm gonna do with this. I'll probably repurpose it at some point in the future i don't know i'll think of something creative to do with it but for now it's just going to sit under there uh, and then this is for the transfer case so that's all good all right center console's in and the shift lever looks pretty perfectly centered in there if you ask me or about as close as it should be you know i was kind of concerned that i might have done something wrong with like the transmission mount because the the shift boot is kind of lopsided but I mean, it's in the middle, so I, everything should be all good. And uh, now I just got to put this back on. But speaking of the center console mount, if you use a TJ cover, then this this mount right here is like right here instead. So you can't use this bolt, which isn't really a problem because you still got this one down here. Where that's a problem, though, is if your, if your center console mount here is broke, then... You don't have either attachment point back here. You don't have that one. So your whole center console is being held by this one screw, which, you know, that might cause the plastic to break if it's moved around too much. But you can modify the TJ cover and get a mount point here if you want. It's, re it's really not that big of a deal. And for this one, I actually have a metal mount. Oh, this is just some high-grade thing. I forgot where I, I bought it from, but... My Cherokee didn't have a broken center console mount when I got it, and I was really proud of that because, you know, like, they all have broken center console mounts. But then I lended it to my friend for a little while, and as soon as I got it back, 
it was broken. So I just put a metal one in here. So now I gotta put that tray in there. Also, I totally forgot to put the heater vent thing in. Real quick, I'll run through how to wire up the reverse lights and the clutch safety switch, which by the way is literally the only wiring mods you need to do. And realistically, you don't even need to do them. So on the automatic, the neutral safety switch is what controls the reverse lights. So when you put the gear selector in reverse, it turns this rod in the neutral safety switch and that closes the circuit between pins two and six. So basically when pin two and six are connected to each other, the reverse lights turn on. That's all there is to it. So all you need to do with a manual swap is run wires from pin two and six to the reverse light switch on the transmission. And it just, it just works because all this thing does is close the circuit. So it doesn't matter what order these wires are in or what color they are or anything. All you need to do is connect the reverse light switch to pins two and six on the NSS connector and your reverse lights will work when you put the transmission in reverse, just like it would from the factory. So for the CSS, I'm going to go back to the NSS, the automatic version. So this thing will only allow the vehicle to start when it's in park or neutral, which is, you know, where it's, where its name comes from. <laughs> so when the transmission is in park, it, bridges the connection between pins seven and eight. So basically to put that very simply, when pins seven and eight are connected, it allows the starter to engage. So literally all you need to do once again is run a wire from pin seven and eight to the clutch safety switch and it will function as intended from the factory. So the starter can only engage if the clutch pedal is pressed in. Uh, and then some of you might be wondering about cruise control which is this whole deal down here. Uh, basically how the NSS determines if you can use cruise is if there are no connections, it will assume you're in drive as a fail safe thing. So if you're not in reverse and you're not in park, then it will just think you're in drive. And this works with the automatic ECU as well. So you literally don't even have to do anything and cruise control will just work. So that sums up literally all of the wiring you need to do for the manual swap. You also don't even need the clutch safety switch. These are pretty expensive for what they are. If you don't need a clutch safety switch, then obviously the starter can engage with it in gear. So you'll just have to be careful. But if you want to do that, all you need to do is connect pins seven and eight to each other, and they'll just always be grounded out to each other. And it will allow the vehicle to start whenever you want it to. Now, my MJ doesn't even have a clutch safety switch from the factory, so, I mean, you, realistically, you don't need it. Just don't be dumb and start it in gear, you know what I mean? Another thing you can do with this circuit is install a kill switch off of it. So you can, you can run the wires like this, so, you know, both the clutch pedal and the kill switch have to be uh, pressed and activated in order for the vehicle to start, which I'm going to do, but there's one problem with this kill switch, is that the vehicle can still be push started. So all this kill switch does is not let the starter engage. Uh, if, if a thief is theoretically smart enough to realize that, they can still push start the car. So this idea for a kill switch is not necessarily the greatest, but I imagine it would still get its job done. So this is what I got for the reverse circuit. This is just gonna plug in to where it always has at the NSS connector. And then I'm gonna run this down to the reverse switch. It's a little bit of a pain to get that all the way up in there, but that's where it connects. So now I'm just going to zip tie it to the existing harness that runs along here and make sure it's all out of the way and not going to touch the exhaust. I also kind of realized that my harness is like over twice as long as it needs to be. Uh, but you know, it's better to have too much than not enough. Real quick, this box up here, this is the transmission control module. Uh, you don't need to do anything with this. It will simply be ignored by the manual computer. Um, and if you're keeping your automatic computer, you don't need to do anything with it either. Uh, if you unplug it, you'll get a check engine light. If you leave it plugged in, you'll get a check engine light. So this thing, it doesn't really matter. You can just leave it there or you can totally take it out for weight reduction, you know, because I imagine that thing weighs, what, like an ounce? 
So I don't know, that's some pretty serious weight gains right there. I had to take the four-wheel drive linkage back out to readjust it entirely because I kind of screwed up earlier. I had to punch out that tab as you saw earlier, but yeah, for the manual install, you need to use a different hole so that it fits in there because it's too long otherwise. Oh shit, look who's here. Yeah, you'll have to shove it all the way in so you can get the, yeah, that's good, that's good. Just enough so you can pop the U-joint into the pinion over there. Uh, you can spin it. You should be able to spin it. There you go. So Jay came over and I taught him how to install a drive shaft and the starter. And then after, you know, loose ends, plugging everything in, the ECU finally came. I finally got the ECU. There it is, that beautiful machine. Now, anytime you do anything with the computer electronically, anytime you touch any of this, make sure the battery is disconnected entirely just to be extra safe. Because you know how they like to reconnect themselves. So I've got a bit of a unique air box here. I just kind of put some heat shielding on it. It made no difference at all that I noticed. It, you know, it might have it might have made a subtle difference, but I didn't notice any change after doing that. Most of you guys would probably not approve of how I got that gear lever back on there. The 3D printed bezel is a really tight fit, but that means it ain't going anywhere. So everything works. As you can see, uh, I obviously needed a new upper shift boot, but this is a pretty low priority thing. It's, it, I mean, it's just a cosmetic thing. So I'm just going to worry about finding one later. I will probably make an update video when I find one that works. I'm going to try to get one that's you know, a lot easier to find so that more people can do this. But anyway, with that, we'll screw the knob on. And we're good to go.